Now, normally we won't cover every pie in the sky, ambitious Indiegogo project because we never know when something might take forever to ship or even turn out to be an outright scam and make us look bad because people think that we were promoting it. So if just anyone had reached out and said, hey, hey Linus, come on over here. We're making the world's smallest ultrabook. Go check out our Indiegogo page we'd probably have closed the email and continue doing the very, very important things that we do around here. But it wasn't just anyone. It was GPD Technology, who has a very respectable pedigree when it comes to designing and building super compact windows and gaming devices. So then, this is it. The P2 Max. It's the world's smallest ultrabook and it is shockingly usable. So on paper, the P2 Max is the closest thing to a bona fide laptop in GPD's lineup yet. It's got an 8.9 inch screen, so that's about the size of the smallest Acer Aspire 1 netbook from back in the day, but at a much higher resolution. It's got touchscreen support and even stylus input support. It's only 650 grams, so that's a little under one and a half pounds for our American friends, and it sports up to 16 gigs of LPDDR3 memory. This is pretty cool. It's got a fingerprint sensor for Windows Hello. So you just go ahead and boop. Boots up just like that. And the IO is competitive with even some full-sized laptops that I've seen. So you've got a full-size USB Type-A on the left along with a three and a half millimeter jack. Then over on the right, you've got a micro HDMI. Now, I'm not a huge fan of this connector because it is quite fragile. But the saving grace here is that you've also got a full-size USB Type-A, so that's two of those, as well as a USB Type-C. And USB Type-C makes so much sense for a device like this because with one dongle, and this is one that I carry around all the time, I can go, here we go, power in, gigabit ethernet, three more USB type A's, a full size HDMI, and of course an SD and a micro SD slot. Pretty darn portable. So I wanna do a full shutdown here so we can have a look at what the boot time is like from cold. Give it a sec. It's a pretty quick shutdown. Let's fire it up. Dang. Wow, that was a cold boot. <laughs> Not too bad. Now with that said, the fan does ramp up pretty loud on first boot. Uh, it does settle in once your background processes finish launching and all of that, but it's definitely audible. Now after first boot and spending some time just, you know, navigating the OS, you know, launching a browser, logging into my email, all that kind of stuff, there were a few observations that I made about usability. First and foremost being that the trackpad is in my opinion, the weakest point of the device. And that really surprised me. Um, not because it looked really amazing or anything, but because usually these subcompact devices have their keyboards as their biggest flaw. Now for the trackpad, the size here, it is usable. Like you can see, I can get most of the way across the screen at a pretty natural speed, but it still felt like a big compromise and the movement rejection while clicking made the cursor move around a little bit more than I'd like, causing me to miss on my double clicks sometimes. So it just wasn't that smooth to use. By contrast, however, the keyboard, which I expected to be the sole reason that I wouldn't find a device like this usable, it ended up being really well balanced. Like, here's the thing, compared to, uh, here, here we go. Compared to their Pocket 2, they only had an extra about, I don't know, what would you say? That's about an inch and change to work with. But I guess this is still more evidence that every inch can make a big difference to the experience. 
So what we lose on the P2 Max is a dedicated delete key, but I'm okay with that because function delete is pretty good. But what we gain is much better spaced arrow keys, a much more favorable layout in terms of hitting things like uh, period and comma down here. We get better spacing between the keys. This feels a lot more cramped than this one does. It makes a shockingly big difference. And this feeling of being less cramped is especially evident right here along the left side of the keyboard where escape, tab, caps lock, shift, and control are all in reasonably natural positions. Now that's not to say that it doesn't take some getting used to the idiosyncrasies of this layout. Uh, for example, instead of your semicolon and apostrophe, your right pinky is now enter, although at least period and comma are reasonably easy to reach down here as are forward slash and your apostrophe right here. And then the other really big one is the fact that there's only a single control and a single alt. So if you wanted to perform something like alt F4, you gotta kind of do that and then, uh, oh right, only a single shift. That one does still bother me, but I also understand why they went this way and I don't see how I could have done it any better. Now moving on to the display. It's a 16 by 10 display which some of you probably already noticed because it is a big deal and it makes the screen feel much bigger than it is. Both because you get that extra vertical space which amounts to less scrolling through content when you're reading and because it actually is physically larger than an equal sized 16 by nine screen, about two and a half percent bigger. Now, how happy you're gonna be with the CPU performance of a machine like this is going to depend heavily on your expectations. It's still only two hyper-threaded cores. So, I mean, I was sitting at around 65 to 70 per f off Chrome. It was interrupting full screen video to prompt me to set it to default. Wow, like I'm already using you. So I was sitting at around 65 to 70% CPU usage while I was installing Premiere and launching Steam for the first time. And I actually spiked to 100% while installing CrossCode with the fan clearly audible above the HVAC in my office. But at least that fan noise does come with a benefit. The M38100Y in this thing managed to turbo up to 2.6, 2.7 gigahertz under full all core loads. And I even saw spikes as high as three gigahertz while performing moderately strenuous tasks. And that's, that's really impressive when you consider the 1.1 gigahertz base clock of the CPU in this thing. So in the real world then, this aggressive turbo behavior along with its support for hyper-threading and the very pleasant surprise of a full PCI Express Gen 3 X4 link to the P2 Max's NVMe SSD boot drive translated into not a fast, but a very responsive experience. Like it's really not bad, you know? Let's, here, let's go ahead and launch a game or something. Like here's a game that I've never launched on this thing. Just installed it for lulz. Like that's, it's portal, it's not heavy, but that's a quick game launch. So it's that responsiveness that I think gives GPD some credibility when they say that this is an ultra book as opposed to a netbook because light productivity uses like Photoshop are absolutely possible. And in an emergency, even light video editing was possible. To be clear, I'm not endorsing switching to any dual core ultrabook as your Premiere Pro workstation, but here's a little project that I did as a float plane exclusive behind the scenes. It's just shot on my phone, 1080p, so it's not heavy footage. But the thing is, in spite of the 100% usage for both the CPU and GPU, it's actually surprisingly responsive to work on. Now coming back to some more likely use cases for a machine like this, it's AC Wi-Fi speeds were really good. I managed 300 megabit both up and down on our high speed connection here at our office. So that resulted in fast downloads, uh, responsive web browsing and fast cloud synchronization. And it was also actually a really good experience for Steam in home streaming, or I think they call it remote play now. So with that, I can actually play desktop games off of machines elsewhere in the office here. So here you go, let's uh, go ahead and fire up some Rocket League, shall we? 
So this makes for a really impressive experience because it's running at native resolution, 2560 by 1600, 60 frames per second. And the thing is that normally you would get some compression artifacts when you are streaming over the network instead of running you know, natively on the PC's display. Except that because this display is so small, it actually ends up looking shockingly clean. Oops, I suck at this game. Oh yeah, like it looks so sharp. And watching 4K YouTube videos was honestly equally impressive. So here's one of our videos running at 4K 30 FPS. I'm gonna go ahead and alt tab out of this and you can see our onboard Intel UHD 615 graphics are running at about 25% and our CPU is sitting in the you know 20 to 25% range and even more impressively is not even at base clock. So it's actually in a power saving state right now while smoothly playing back 4K video. And you know, I think really watching 4K YouTube is one of the best use cases for this device. The screen is super sharp thanks to its 2560 by 1600 resolution. It's bright, it's tuned fairly neutrally, so you won't end up with that Best Buy showroom experience out of the box. And the size of it allows it to sit nicely in between the inconvenience of pulling a full-size laptop out of your bag and the tiny, whiny eye strain o vision of watching content on your phone. See, look at that, it's like right in between. All right, let's go ahead and crack this thing open. Really the most impressive thing about this thing was that it never really felt slow. Like it didn't feel fast all the time, but I never was like sitting there going, wow, I'm really just waiting around for this thing. So let's have a, let's have a look at the internals here. So there's our processor, dual core hyperthreaded, as I mentioned before, Intel Wi-Fi chip right there. Here's our RAM, so it looks like they've soldered that onto the board rather than using a SODIM, and I guess they've got a good reason for it because when I checked inside hardware info, I actually found that the RAM is running in dual channel mode, at least on the 16 gig version, so that's really nice because there will be a performance benefit there. The battery is a 35 watt hour affair that actually takes up a very significant portion of the internals of the device here, so you can see it's the full thickness of the thing, and uh, actually the only thing over here on this side of it seems to be this small daughter board for IO. And then finally, we've got a pretty good look at the cooling system here. So that's our uh, regrettably pretty whiny little fan. And then we've got a single heat pipe running from the CPU, which of course has the graphics uh, built into it, over to a small heat exchanger that exhausts here at the back of the unit. Overall, there's not much for me to complain about build quality wise. They are using a single unibody piece of aluminum. So you can actually see, even with the bottom cover off, there's not a ton of flex here. And unlike their previous devices, I was actually very pleasantly surprised by the quality of the speakers in the P2 Max. They're not amazing, but they are definitely usable and at least they're stereo. And obviously the flex is even better once you actually put the bottom on the thing. So the conclusion here is I think it's obvious that I have a bit of a soft bot for GPD. I mean, to be clear, they've never sponsored us or anything like that. And I've never even met anyone there face to face. I guess I just can excuse some of the compromises that they make in their designs because I respect someone who's willing to do things differently instead of just making the same bloody thing as everyone else over and over and over again. Like it's, it's kind of like what I said about the original LG Gram. Like, yeah, it had some build quality issues. And honestly, so does the P2 Max. There's more rattle in the trackpad than I'd like, though they may fix that for mass production. Uh, but LG had a goal, make the lightest device. And damn it, they accomplished that. So same thing here. Yeah, you're gonna have to change some of your typing habits, but assuming that you've got pretty good eyes and you can handle the smaller screen, you will be carrying around a shockingly functional and convenient device that weighs just one and a half pounds. And this absolutely blew my mind, even though like it shouldn't, like it makes sense. It charges off of a flipping 30 watt quick charge phone adapter. 
that's pretty freaking cool. So even though the P2 Max isn't the smallest device out of GPD, I think it is their best and their most usable one to date. And at around 700 US dollars in the Indiegogo campaign, I think it's priced not low, but definitely reasonably. So thanks for watching guys. If you disliked this video, you can hit that button. But if you liked it, hit like, get subscribed, or maybe consider checking out where to buy the GPD P2 Max at the link in the video description. Also down there is our merch store, which has cool shirts like the one I'm wearing and our community forum, which you guys should totally join.